Hi, Julie, and welcome to the uh, Five Goats RWA Tokenization Podcast. It's a pleasure having you here. Uh, we're quite excited because we know how fast you've moved into the space and some of the developments that you've done. And you have a couple of first mover marks that we wanted to talk about to your SPAC, your ESOPs, and just in general, what you've created in the ecosystem as a whole and where you see things going and what else we can expect from you. So we'd like to just turn it over. Just go ahead and give us an introduction about IX Swap, Investa X, and tell us a little bit more about what you have going on. Great to be here on Five Goats and appreciate all the work you're doing to push the industry forward. Yeah, just a quick quick one. I'm <clears throat> my name is Julian Quan. I'm, I'm co-founder and CEO of, of two platforms in the space. Investa X started as one of the first real estate crowdfunding platforms in Singapore. It was focused on global product and global investors, but for real estate assets. And we started that off in 2015. And as the ICO boom came in 2017, 18, we looked at the technology stack there, thought that's what we were missing in the first generation of online investment platforms. Tokenizing real world assets makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> in a world of digital currencies, we're in a world of digital securities. We're going to see a whole new paradigm, a new shift of creation of, you know, explosion of value. So we wanted to be at the forefront of that. We, we looked around and thought, you know, what is needed there for anyone to tokenize an, a real world asset. They want to kind of have a one-stop shop. That would mean on top of our broker dealer, we'd add an exchange, we'd add custody solutions, we'd throw away the old platform, we'd build it all blockchain enabled. We're very pro public protocol architecture and also built IXWAP, which is the first automated market maker for asset backed tokens and security tokens in the world. So the mission that we still on every day is to build this <clears throat> one-stop shop, which allows any any investment firm to tokenize any asset legally and compliantly and technically, and for any investors to come into these projects, invest into these assets in a in, in on regulated platforms. But so essentially, we kind of created a, a DeFi, TradFi uh, hybrid infrastructure because a lot of the underlying assets are traditional, like real estate or startup shares or whatever. But <clears throat> I think the real plugging issuing them as those assets on blockchain allows you to plug into the power and the innovation of all the digital asset space from stable coins to, you know, NFTs and DAOs and, and all this kind of stuff. So that's been the journey and we continue on that kind of on a daily basis. <laughs> Quite OG there, these dates going back as far as tokenization. And one of the reasons this initiative began is to help put companies that are really building something out in the spotlight, show what they're doing well, who they're built for and the actors in the space making these moves. And one of the things that we want to talk about really quick, because you have so much going on is like, can you just tell us like what kind of assets have been tokenized so far? And then like how your process aims to democratize. <clears throat> yeah, sure. You know, when we think about tokenization, we think about digitizing shares of investment vehicles, which are <clears throat> essentially attached to all kinds of assets, real estate, private equity, venture startups, commodities. And so our, our, our kind of vision was that, you know, all of these assets will be tokenized at a government level. You're currently at a position where people have issued a, a new fund or a company as a piece of paper, because that's how it's been done traditionally since the beginning of time. And then you have companies like ours tokenizing the shares of, so we're, we're, there's a lot of those tokenized securities, which again, could be anything we've done real estate art. We've got secondaries of startups. We have uh, private equity assets. We have some ESG related projects coming down the pipeline. Our carbon credits are being tokenized. So it's very, very diverse. And I think ultimately it was like, you're in a world now where private companies like ours are stepping in to tokenize these assets. And again, there's that, that will continue on for a very, very long time. You also have the development of what I call real security tokens, which is, is blockchain based um, structures with no paper actually. Interestingly, the real security tokens, I call them, are actually the DAOs that were issued as investment vehicles on blockchain. They're challenged at the moment because most governments don't consider Ethereum to be a legitimate jurisdiction for yeah. securities, but the structure of what they've done is actually what security tokens are. Although there are jurisdictions like Switzerland and Germany who sanctioned, you know, paperless based investment offerings as being, you know, legal, legally in structures in those companies. So ultimately. You know, we see a world where government bodies, because they're the, the ones that issue new funds and new companies in wherever jurisdictions, they'll all move to the DLT and, and blockchain based um, systems because it's just much better. You know, why would you as a company, as a country, I should say, want, want not want to open up your laptop and see the 50,000 companies in your jurisdiction and who owns them, who really owns them that second, not 
who might have sold three weeks ago and there's pieces of paper floating around the world and who are the real directors and who's everything real. So I think you'll see that it brings a lot more transparency to private markets. Therefore, governments will jump on top of on, on top of that and, and leading jurisdictions around the world kind of are. What's, what's interesting now is that we've been very agnostic to the asset classes in terms of we want to help anyone from an, any, anyone who's uh, managing any type of asset who wants to move into tokenization get there. But I think what's really interesting that that you know that's, that's really been missing from the space is the fact that you know most people have just been thinking you know tokenized assets liquidity for liquid assets which is it's a kind of a very misunderstood or very call it immature statement or a very limited statement for yeah, yeah but to say yeah. that liquidity is one thing for all assets is doesn't make any sense right where does it trade how big is it who's behind it what's the performance what's the minimum share where are the venues and it goes on and on and on so the liquidity of any asset is not guaranteed to change at all in a token format. But if you do start to tokenize assets, you start to see the benefits of digital versus paper. And the 101 of that is very simple, transparency, efficiency, you know, cost, et cetera. But the real value of tokenization from our perspective is use, making these assets multidimensional, much more useful. So if I have a share of your VC fund sitting in my drawer, typically I'll wait 15 years to get a payout and that's about it. But if I could actually use that, if I had a security token of your fund and I could take it to platforms like ours, you could then trade. That's already a massive upside. But then if you could actually lend, borrow and stake, which are these are services that we're starting to work on now, which is just coming to market. Okay. And then if you could plug into, like, for example, our AMM and create a liquidity pool and give, give liquidity life and breathe life into that asset, you're starting to see multiple, multiple dimensions of value far beyond fundraising, far beyond sort of tradability. And I think that... That's, that's where it's going from a perspective of the real value proposition. And even groups like JP Morgan, who have built Onyx, a, a tokenization platform, they're tokenizing a lot of their assets and most of their assets are publicly traded. When I asked them why they're doing that, they said, oh, because even though they're publicly traded, a lot of them aren't very useful. And in a token format, again, we can, we can start exploring much more lending, borrowing, staking these types of usable or functionalities, I should say, around the assets, which dramatically increases the value of these assets. So that's even coming from you know a bank tokenizing public market assets, which are already pretty tradable and liquid. And if you start then looking out at the whole universe of the private markets, which are five to 10 times bigger than the public markets, you start to really get excited by how big this opportunity is and, and all the different areas. And it's all kind of blue ocean right now because it's it's only a couple of years old and there's so, so many years for infrastructure to come to the table in terms of licensed infrastructure. So security token broker dealers, security token custodians, security token exchanges. And we built the first market maker. You know, there's a lot of stuff still being built, but that's now come to fruition. And now you have much higher quality issuers and assets coming to the tokenization space. And every bank, every bank and their dog is now is now has already done stuff and trying to do a lot more. And mm -hmm. you know, the industry is starting to grow a lot faster now. Yeah, it's definitely going to start seeing a lot of things just catalyzed because once something's tokenized, now you have everything else on the on the DeFi side and all these different blockchain transactions available. So walk us through like a one of your use cases or real world example. Of your yeah, most well, there's a few. We, we tokenized our ESOPs for our own staff so they could start to trade them amongst each other, which is, I think, makes the concept of ESOPs much more valuable instead of typically as a team member signing up to a startup getting your ESOPs, fingers crossed, hopefully the company sells in 10 years. So that's really cool, really interesting. We we actually bought a Board Ape Yacht Club, one of the blue chip NFTs. And and when they were, you know, at one point, I think they were $200,000 value. A lot of people didn't want to pay that, but they wanted to kind of get into it. So we put it into a company structure, a tokenized economic interests of that company. So you could buy a share of a Board Ape for a dollar. That was pretty interesting. More for a use case kind of. On the bigger end of town or the more serious end of town, I guess, we we... we we won a, a grant from the, the government in Singapore. They launched for the first time an onshore fund vehicle called the uh, Singapore Variable Capital Company. And we tokenized that with UBS as the real estate fund manager and State Street as the fund administrator and PwC and all this kind of stuff. Because this new fund structure had come out and we said to the government, like, this is an equal competitor to BVI and Cayman because you're trying to drive the asset management industry growth in Singapore. <clears throat> and I think a lot of these you know, offshore tax havens are sunset kind of places. But we went and said, all right, well, this is great. It's equal to these. What if we tokenize that it? it would be even better, add even more value. So 
we were even able to get financial support from the government to do that. So that was really interesting. And then there's a lot of other stuff that's coming down the pipeline as well. We did some art with uh, one of the investment banks. If I think about the discussions I was having yesterday, there's always real estate. Real estate's a pretty obvious asset class for you know fractionalization, tokenization. And we're just looking at a lot more alternative, interesting things. Because I think what tokenization can do is it can bring a lot of transparency and, and I think more eyeballs to deals that were typically private and potentially more obscure in terms of, you know, that's what private markets uh, are. They're, they're private deals. So, so a lot of people would like to invest into these different asset classes, but you know, who do you trust? Where do you go? How do you do diligence? Where am I going to sell this? What happens if something goes wrong? A lot of those questions kind of get alleviated if you end up putting it in a tokenized format, put it on a platform because you've then essentially brought a lot of the public market attributes to private market assets which is why people like them, tradability, transparency, price discovery, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of how we see that, that space. <clears throat> that's exciting. And you mentioned, you're mentioning some pretty big names and stuff like that, which is, you know, big giant adoption signals. So based on that, you know, and what you're developing, what you know is being built out there and how regulation is evolving in the space, where do you see everything going? Well, I think from, you know, the Wall Street end of town is, 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 deep in the space already. There's there's a lot of inefficiencies in financial institutions. So saving money is 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 saving, you know, saving costs, reduction of costs, I should say, is is probably the number one reason why I see all the banks moving into that space. You know, distributed ledger, you think about the financial markets, a, a, a super large percentage of companies in that space exist to transact, to help transactions, because there's there's no trust involved, whether it's a bank, whatever it is. So Blockchain DLT technology removes the need for a lot of those middlemen and therefore a lot of those processes. Yeah. So on the big end of town, it's more about cost reduction. Everybody else, and I mean everyone else as in the, the real estate manager down the road with a $50 million fund or a startup or whatever it is, I think they're all exploring for a lot of the other reasons that are really interesting around tokenization in terms of you know tokenizing assets brings a lot more visibility and transparency to those private assets, potentially a lot more distribution venues, more eyeballs. They're looking at, I think that, and that's a very broad statement, but a lot of the, the call it the smaller groups, they're looking at to, you know, what's innovative, what's new. If you look at the public markets, the history of public markets, all the major expansions of capital was when new technology married the marketplace. Two examples, electronic trading, the development of the ETF structure, that was a failed experiment at six million dollars on in 1979 it's now a seven trillion dollar asset class so if you're thinking about it from a from a fund manager or an asset owner's perspective it's like we've had zero innovation besides like docs docusign maybe for like 50 years in the private markets we now have an opportunity as this technology marries into this marketplace to be an early mover in the space as in work it out get it started get my first shares tokenized understand protocols understand the infrastructure those that invest early in technology typically get the asymmetrical returns so i think people coming into the space to tokenize assets right now there's a lot of people that are just looking for money and i think they're very misguided because you still have to raise money regardless but there's a lot more sophistication coming to the market in 2023 because again, a lot of people who haven't been in the space don't know that people like us have been building for five years. So it's not like overnight by any means, but there's a lot more maturation that it's not cryptocurrency. There's all these different use cases. There's all this value. The big end of town is hard at work and has been for a while. And, you know, like how do you differentiate yourself? Like what, what you see something so powerful and interesting. And if you, if you, if you're a supporter of cryptocurrency and DeFi, which we certainly are, you see something so innovative and powerful in that space, it's going to, it is affecting the financial markets. If you're an investment company, you're in the financial markets. I mean, if you're not interested in this right now, if you've never heard of it, fine. If you have heard of it, and you're not interested, you know, it, that, that, that would be extremely surprising because it's, it's, it's sort of t touching all the aspects. And I think the last thing I'd say is that if you look at it from, if you, if you think about it from a kind of a macro level, everything's moving to platforms right? Everything from social media to finance to, you know, booking taxis, which, you know, everything's moving to these platforms. So, and, and you had in, in the crypto space, you had all the, the, the cryptocurrency guys, the big guys, they started, have started looking at the real world asset tokens, security tokens. So they're coming for the TradFi assets. And then in the traditional finance side, you have, you know, DBS Bank in Singapore, Standard Chartered just announced this. They've launched cryptocurrency exchanges. 
So you can see that all the TradFi guys are coming for the DeFi and all the, the big DeFi guys are coming for the TradFi and now with RWA and STOs. It's just going to see a world of all these digital assets. There's going to be an insanely different and much bigger universe for distribution of your assets. So that's the other key thing, I think, from an investment perspective, if you're running around, because if you think about it, like, you know, if you're in America and you want to raise some money in Asia, you get on a plane and you run around and you carry pieces of paper and you have 50 million coffees and everyone says yes. And then, you know, 49% of people said, you know, said no afterwards, whatever. It's in a whole ordeal. But that's, and then, you know, that's the old way of doing things. The, the, the new way is, well, why don't we tokenize it, put it on different platforms. There's a whole new world of distribution channels private banks, wealth managers, et cetera, who wouldn't distribute private market assets before because they're not kind of publicly traded. But in a tokenized format, they're aggressively now looking for new products to sell because they're all selling Bitcoin and they're trying to find the next thing. And the next big thing is a big opportunity for them to create more revenues and be relevant to their audiences to start distributing tokenized assets. So there's a lot going on there, but I think that's the value that goes far beyond uh, fundraising and far beyond, you know, liquidity for liquid assets. And that that's what, you know, hopefully we're sharing today and hopefully more people take away from today's kind of discussion. Julian, in your, in your experience or your, in your head here, what was the hardest part of, of this journey and tokenizing assets for you? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. What's the hardest part? I think the hardest part is there's a lot of hard parts in startups, of course, regulated technology, very long, drawn out, painful negotiations, discussions with regulators about how this new tech is better than the old tech. And this is why we should get licenses and that goes opportunity. And I think holistically, the number one problem is just human mindset and the inability to embrace change. And when you think about uh, quickly, I should say. And so that's why in 2023, it feels like kind of the dam is broke on RWA and STOs, but it's also because if you almost, if you go back to December 31st, there's been four or five years of those in the industry saying the same things and pushing the same things through and everyone's saying, oh, you know, it sounds good, interesting, but I'm having a good time here. I'm making a lot of money and, you know, I don't really want to change. I don't really learn anything or this might actually remove my whole company and my service from this whole <laughs> ecosystem. So that I think ultimately, and there's been so much confusion, you know, people used to call us up and say, you guys are the ones that do the Bitcoin real estate. And I'm like, what is Bitcoin real estate? And they're like, ah, Bitcoin real estate. I was like, that doesn't even make any sense. Like, you know, so I think, you know, because the STO market started as failed ICOs in 2017 and, you know, people, the SEC started saying they look like security tokens. And then that was one side of it. And then also the, the guy selling ICOs went, oh, people aren't buying ICOs. They want some just equity. Okay, let's just call it STO, basically. That's all they did. So the beginning of the industry was, extremely challenged with a whole bunch of garbage and a whole bunch of scammers and a whole bunch of people doing stuff illegally. And the SEC saying those STOs are illegal. It was like, no, 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 that ICO is legal. STO is legal if you do it legally. Like, but so there was that whole time of confusion and is this cryptocurrency and all that kind of stuff, which again, it's taken some time, but now we've got separation mm -hmm. of like we, the markets understanding that that's different. We are using the technology but it's not cryptocurrency, it's real assets. And of course, always helps when all the big guys at the front of Wall Street are BlackRock saying tokenization you know, is the next generation of securities and all that kind of stuff, that narratives come out. Yeah. So you need that, even though they're all just about themselves and they don't really help generally anyone outside their existing network, but you need all that. So there's a combination of a lot of things, but it's really just that mindset and people, it was blatantly obvious to the first time I sent Ethereum to myself, I went, this is how we should send our real estate shares. And so it was very obvious to us and our team very early on. And it's just taken a lot longer and harder as everything is in startup land. So <laughs> that's kind of how it goes. You mentioned a couple of times like this paper process and, and the new process, smart contracts, blockchain and everything being you know advanced so technically. This is almost like web one going <laughs> to web three almost in a sense because some of the, especially real estate, that is definitely paper process, right? And now we're talking about buying a million dollar apartment building you're tapping on your phone and the, the next level of this I mean, yeah out. definitely and i think you know without blockchain at least focusing on just the real estate topic without blockchain you can see over the last couple of years that all the big guys you know blackrock apollo etc they've been hard at work in washington and elsewhere around the world lobbying for greater access to retail investors so without 
blockchain, there's mm -hmm. been a big push from the top end of town to come down into the, to the masses. And what's interesting is that most people who run funds and whatnot don't take smaller retail investors predominantly because they don't want to deal with the paperwork. And that's literally what they say. I don't deal with the paperwork. Why don't I want to sell a share for $10? Like it's going to cost me whatever X, Y, Z to, to process it. So what's really exciting about tokenization is through different structures, you could, it doesn't cost you that much more to send out a million tokens and have a million people buying or send out, you know, $1 million token. Uh, again, through platforms and with the right structures and, and, and scaling it over time. So, you know, you've actually now got the technology that the big guys have been hoping for or the technology that solves a lot of the problems that they've actually been petitioning the governments for, which is more of an open architecture. And then, as you know, with the whole Web3 space, that the DNA of that is, is more community ownership and community driven. So what's interesting about, I think, security tokens for kind of the Web3 space is there has been a false narrative in my mind. I would say an incomplete narrative that if you buy a token of an ecosystem, that's the whole value. That couldn't be further from the truth. How do we know that? Because Anderson Horowitz is sitting on the cap table. <laughs> Why are there people sitting on the cap table of Solana and you know, you know, protocol and all these kind of things? Because these are businesses, right? So what's interesting about security tokens and Web three is that you now have an opportunity, which I think is the new, the next, the next shift and the next paradigm of fundraising for, for especially Web three startups. Instead of just giving you know, a bunch of the users in the community, a few of the ICO tokens in the public sale. Again, a lot of the private and pre-sale tokens are reserved for the big guys anyway. You can now give them real ownership. You can issue an STO and an ICO and really give true ownership to the community. And, you know, if I'm a startup, do I want a million dollar check from Brad or do I want a million users with a $1 share each of my business? That's an extreme example. I certainly would... I think everyone would go for the million users, right? Because you're getting actual real business out of it as well. So I think there's there's a lot of exciting things that will happen related to tokenization, linking it to other types of tokens and being able to use that to grow businesses and strengthen community ownership and probably, you know, and, and hopefully drive a, a much better business or protocol or whatever, whatever anyone, whatever anyone's building. You mentioned a very important point there. A lot of times fundraising is exhausting. It's it, you have to plan for it and it's an entire roadmap in itself. And if you could tell people about your business and, and get people on board and they're not on board for a million dollar check, they're on board for a smaller ticket and they're diversified and a bunch of this stuff is happening. That opens the door for a completely different mindset and velocity for raising funds for early stage. Companies. Yeah. And I think that's, I think you, you touch on the most important thing. It, opens the door to a completely different mindset. You know, what can we do here? What can we do with this stuff? Like, again, that's what we need as well. Cause we need people outside of like, uh, from the, invest, the issuer side of like, oh, this is just a way to raise money or dump poor quality assets on, you know, idiot retail crypto guys, which couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, yeah. And that's been a challenge as well. But then I think if you start to think, well, now we're going to see some really, we're going to see the next development of, you know, the next version of the ETF in token, we're working on it now, like real estate fund 2.0, VC fund 2.0, you know, different forms of, of existing type of structures that will add a lot more value to both sides. And that's, that's also one of the biggest opportunities, which again, if looking at tokenization, I think if any startups are out there looking at this space, one of the biggest, I think the biggest opportunities is to create those new products, right? The next, the next kind of ETF in a tokenized format in four, blockchain and for and then connecting that to you know and looking at the icos the nfts the DAOs, what's all the magic that's being created in there outside of the scams how do you extract that and then come out with these new products that are going to really you know be the next generation of products that we want to invest into that's very exciting stuff so let's say i'm a i'm a metaverse ceo i'm a founder i've got a great project i'm thinking about an ico token raise or i'm seeking capital and I come across this podcast and I say, hey, that sounds interesting. So talk to me. What does that really mean for this founder, right? Who's It's a metaverse person <clears> or they're an engineer or their background is in. Yeah, the this month we are launching the IXS Launchpad. And so what IXS, IXS started as, a, as an automated market maker, which allowed anyone with an asset-backed token to create a liquidity pool. 
you know, we call it a uni swap for security tokens, which is really exciting. Mm-hmm. Read liquidity into any asset, any size. I mean, you can start a liquidity pool with $10,000. So that's really exciting. What we also realized was we need to get retail access to security tokens. Investor X was accredited investors and above. That's just how it's been. And that's makes the most sense for that platform. So IX Swap's now launching security tokens for everyone. Everyone being literally everyone. You don't have to have any net worth. You don't have to validate or prove that you're worth anything in particular. You have to just do basic KYC. So we know who you are. And so what it means to sort of these metaverse founders and other people in Web3 is like, you know, ICOs and NFTs and non-asset backed tokens are fantastic innovation. There's a lot of use case for it. There's a lot of uh, perceived, there's a lot of not real use case for it, I would say, or over, over projected. What you now can start to do, again, I swap would love to help all these groups is you can start to issue equity tokens, debt tokens. You can start to issue different types of, you know, real, real assets as security tokens for the same audience, right? It's not now just for the wealthy, accredited, sophisticated guys. It's for the same audience. So we're looking for more startups that we can help. We're launching the first couple next month or this month, I should say. And it's literally a dollar. We've made, we've pushed the companies and the founders to take you know, it's one dollar USDC will get you, or USDT, whichever the, the currency is, will get you an STO. So, you know, now if you're really excited and want to build a, a community that has more, that again, I think a lot of founders are forced into VC investing here, and then how do we get community built over here? Just by the nature of how the world's been. Now you can still have your VCs. It's always good to have some brand name investors that do due diligence, lead the deals work out valuations I still think that's that's very pro but like open that up to your community and give them real ownership and then you'll have sort of the diehard you know you've seen people how diehard they are in these crypto communities like imagine having that on your equity table as well that'd be that'd be really exciting so I think that that's that's the new shift and that's something that we'd like to be able to help more startup founders with and again it's really bringing this together because I, I think it's tradition it's really being a lot of people like we, we just want to do tokens. We don't want any regulations, too much drama. Oh, but then they're all still super concerned that they're staying within the rails of not getting, you know, caught later on. Well, we can help you do both those types. We can do ICOs, but we can help with all of this now legally and compliantly. And we built the systems to, to match the UX UI of crypto. So IXWAP looks and feels like Uniswap. It's just, there's a lot more going on in the background. So we've, we've, Worked really hard on the product side to make it look and feel like crypto. The assets are now changing. It's no harder than it was before in crypto to sell security tokens. That's the exciting part. And I think that's where you're going to see a whole bunch of new activity in the space. That sounds super exciting. So would you say that the Web3 founder or startup founders is one of your main market segments that you're on launch right on IXS Launchpad? Yeah, for sure. Oh, Investor X is more real estate fund managers, private equity guys, you know, the bigger end of town. IX Swap is much more degen. We're looking for early stage companies that are excited by security tokens. We've got the the ability to create liquidity pools and trading for that. We and we think also that, you know, what's exciting for issuing security to what we're doing at least, and I don't know if anyone else in the world's doing this yet, we're structuring a similar way. So if you think about the ICO structure, it was basically a hyperspeed of a traditional, you know, Silicon Valley startup where there's a seed round and then there's a year or two and there's a series A and then there's a year or two and series B, et cetera, it's an IPO. Let's just say for argument's sake, that's a 10 year process. The ICO guys want to do that in three months or six months, right? You know, pre-seed round, seed round, public, private sale, public sale, launch on a crypto exchange, <laughs> all within sort of three, four months. But that was exciting. And that's how they got money to build these projects. What I think is interesting about security tokens is what we're doing is we're looking to mirror a lot more of that excitement from a structural perspective. So launching seed round STOs, launching the pre-sale, maybe the public sale, six months, 12 months, whatever, and trying to and trying to mirror like what a lot of the crypto guys are used to and what the ICO system used to. So again, this is all pretty new and exciting. So we'll see how it all kind of unfolds. But I think there's just a lot more exciting ways to raise money, especially if you're Web3. You know, why would you not issue your equity as tokens if you're a Web3 guy. I mean, you get it. They're the, they're the easiest guys to explain this to. <laughs> yeah, you're getting you're seeing safes and SAFs and all this different stuff, but yours, yours is pure tokenized. Right? Yeah, and that's that's why it's also good because like, you know, the TradFi guys, again, one of the challenges is just to explain everything to everyone all the time. Whereas if you speak to Web3 founders, you know, it's 
there's no blockchain question. There's not many blockchain questions. <laughs> it's just more about how does this work and who's getting what and what's the value and all that. So yeah, exciting times on that front. Awesome, awesome. Well, that sounds like super, super exciting. You've got it. Sounds like you're you're hitting on like almost every segment out there. Institutions right down to the one dollar retail investor, which yep. is the dream. That if you have an ecosystem that services everybody in the market. So to wrap things up, where do you see things going in the space? What are you preparing for? And what are you most excited about? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there'll be a lot more of the same as in Wall Street continues on. We've got banks wanting to white label our tech and how do these AMMs work? And now people are writing, you know, JP Morgan's writing, you know, reports on AMM models and how this is going to affect TradFi. We're like, yep, we built one two years ago, but that's great. So there'll be a lot more of, more <laughs> of the same with those guys coming down. I think... There's a lot of exciting developments on the other end, on the other spectrum of town. So you have a lot more interesting alternative assets coming to the marketplace. And I do think, you know, what I'm most excited about is the convergence, right, of which you can see all the way from the crypto guys and the banks doing crypto exchanges and STOs, but merely from the concept of, we believe fundamentally that tokenization, you know, all assets will be tokenized and that you should be able to open your phone just like you do with interactive brokers or Coinbase or whatever, and just buy and sell stuff and everything kind of moves around and interacts with each other. So most excited by the fact that a lot of the rest of the world's finally woken up to the stuff that we've been <laughs> working on for four or five years. So it's, it's kind of some validation, I guess. And there's just more capital coming into the space and it's just more, it's just becoming more obvious that, you know, this is a big thing, especially in Asia, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, super pro tokenization, probably not pro retail trading of crypto, which they can't stop anyway, but that's probably the only subset of area that's a question mark, but stable coins and tokenized assets and security tokens and they're, Asia's very, very pro. So I, I'm, I'm most excited by the kind of the tokenization of kind of everything and, 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 the, and all these other players coming in the space and putting their lives and money and energy in the space to, to build it up and, and to, to see things continue moving at a faster pace than ever before. So that, that's probably my thoughts on that. Yeah, that's definitely going to be it. This, this, the pace of everything, like you're saying, raising capital for a startup or going in and, and starting a fund, all these things take time. But what it sounds like is that the future of tokenization is going to bring a velocity to that that probably we can't comprehend right now. And then the amount of capital that will be available for, for this digital economy as well. That's, uh, that's huge strides from where we're at now. So it's probably going to take you know five or six years for some of the stuff to really get, get going for where everyone's seeing it. Right now, I know all the Web3 natives hear about it. It's all over our news and our feeds and stuff like that. But the rest of the world still know. And I think it's probably like, what, two, three years till everyone's talking about it? Or what do you think? Do you yeah, to... I mean, I guess it depends on who you are, right? The older older people like my parents just can't even get the terminology right. You know, bit what's that bit thing bit thing called? I mean, look, they're pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made them buy Bitcoin a while ago, so that was good. But I think like, ultimately... I think, you know, there'll be just, I think the, the best way to think about it is, is like you've had to, you have to talk about tokenization. You have to talk about blockchain today. And so the, I think the end state is you, you're back to talking about what's behind these tokens without having a, like a real estate investments or, or startup investments. And that, that's when we've, we've kind of penetrated because it's underpinning applications we're using. We don't know it in brackets. We don't have to say it. Just like a lot of things we do now that are digital, we don't actually talk about the technology. We just open the app, book this, do this, whatever, buy this, send this. You just, you, you're really focused on the actual experience. So I think, yeah, different paces over time. The smart, I would say the intelligent governments are progressing very quickly to regulate in a positive way and capture this opportunity. The There are other major issues, like I guess US is probably the biggest in terms of just so many competing interests, still confused and stuck in a, a bit of a, a holding pattern that'll clear up i think over time and i think that yeah it just depends on, on what space you're looking at and where you are and in the world so it, it is important to to find out what's truly behind the jurisdictions that are very pro or anti because often things aren't really what they seem on the surface but i think ultimately yeah it's just every day it grows we're getting inquiries from all kinds of big small old new companies every single day. So we can see that momentum building. And I think that's happening around the globe. So yeah, it's all pretty positive. We're excited by, you know, the future and we're hard at work building it out with the team that we got. Very exciting. It sounds like nothing but good things to come. 
Well, I really appreciate it, Julian. Is there anything else you want to tell anyone before we wrap up? No, look, thanks a lot for having us, Brad. Enjoyed the conversation. Hopefully that was helpful to everyone. People are excited and interested in what we've been talking about. You can register on either platform. I think those links will be in the show notes, but iXswap and InvestX. Yeah, definitely join the iXswap Launchpad. That's, that's, we've worked really hard, which is two and a half years, licensing technologies to be able to get people to send a USDC and own a, a share of a, a startup, which is what, what is probably most exciting for us this week. <laughs> and we'll take it from there. And well, we'll be following your work, and I really do appreciate your time. Thanks, thanks Brad. Time. Thanks for having us, and thanks for the community for listening today.